Olá, nós temos a enorme satisfação de receber na Universidade Federal do Paraná, aqui na TV UFPR, um colega dos Estados Unidos, da Universidade de Colômbia, e que vem discutir conosco nesse momento sobre um dos temas mais importantes hoje no mundo, no Brasil de maneira especial, que é, relaciona-se ao controle das doenças transmissíveis. Nós temos acompanhado todos no Brasil, muito atentos e com muita preocupação, a grande explosão das epidemias de dengue, zika vírus, chikungunya, febre amarela, várias outras doenças transmissíveis que, vamos dizer, nos despertam todos os dias quando acordamos para esses problemas que nos acometem é, cada vez de maneira mais forte no, na última década, sobretudo. Várias é, são as tentativas, várias são as formas de tentar controlar as doenças, especialmente essas doenças transmissíveis. Trata-se de um problema mundial, trata-se de um problema que está no Brasil e que, infelizmente ainda, a medicina sozinha não consegue controlar. Não só para essas doenças, mas vários outros problemas, não é somente da ordem da medicina dos médicos é, fazer o seu controle e trabalhar na sua prevenção. Esse tipo de doença, esse tipo de problema, envolve um conjunto representativo de outros profissionais, que aí fazem apelo a essa ideia da multicausalidade em saúde e que faz apelo a uma série de outros profissionais para não somente o conhecimento, mas a busca também de formas de controle e de prevenção dessas doenças. É sobre essa temática importantíssima dos nossos dias que a Universidade Federal do Paraná desenvolve inúmeras pesquisas e que traz, nesse momento, a partir de uma cooperação com a Universidade de Colômbia, o professor Pietro Secato, que é professor da Universidade de Colômbia, e que nós temos a enorme satisfação de receber e para que, na TV UFPR, desenvolver esse breve, rápido e interessante debate que, a partir desse momento, vamos desenvolver. Então, seja muito bem-vindo, professor Pietro Secato. Gostaria que o senhor nos falasse um pouco da sua experiência sobre o trato com as doenças transmissíveis e as formas de controle e prevenção que no seu grupo de estudos têm sido desenvolvidos. Muito obrigado. So I'm going to talk in English to um, to present the work that I'm doing at the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. It's part of the Earth Institute at Columbia University, and the work we do is to understand how the climate impact the diseases, especially the vector-borne diseases, including uh, all the diseases transmitted by the mosquitoes that you mentioned, Zika, Dengue, Malaria, but also uh, the trypanosomiasis. It's a disease that impacts uh, populations in Africa. Uh, it's transmitted by a fly, the tsetse fly. So we look at all those different diseases and see how the climate impact the vector the mosquitoes, the flies, even uh, the snail, like in the schistosomiasis. And so what we do at IRI is try to understand how the climate impact those diseases, to see in the past, right now, and in the future, so we can anticipate the future climate, how it will impact those diseases. And we do a lot of studies to try to understand this relationship between the climate, the precipitation, when you have more precipitation, you have more puddles of water for the mosquitoes to breed. We look at the temperature to see how the increase of the temperature impact the transmission of the diseases. For example, the activity of the mosquitoes or the, the plasmodium, the malaria, how it is impacted by the temperature. And we do that by using station data when they are available. But in most countries where we work, like in Africa, or even certain part of Brazil, like in the Amazon, we don't have many stations to measure the precipitation, to measure the temperature, to measure even the ecosystem, how the mosquitoes interact in the ecosystem, how floods impact the development of mosquitoes. So to do that, we use satellite images. Yes. And for the satellite images, I work directly with the NASA, um, other agencies uh, like NOAA, the European Space Agency, so basically what we do is to have access to the satellite images to understand how the precipitation, the temperature, um, vegetation as well, the presence of water, infrastructure, um, how we can use that information for 
transmitting that information to the decision maker. So the hospitals, the ministries of health, they have access to those data so they can forecast when there are higher risk of malaria or schistosomiasis. It's a disease transmitted by snail in the water. So I'm able to monitor in almost real time all the puddles in Africa or in Latin America, in the US, in Europe, with satellite images at high spatial resolution. So we can see at 30 meter uh, resolution and even go down to meters uh, spatial resolution. Ótimo. Uh, você nos falou estes dias sobre um exemplo na África em que você trabalhou com uma área que não tinha dados do próprio local, mas numa equipe vocês fizeram os estudos usando imagens de satélite e você pôde ajudar no controle de algumas doenças. Você poderia uhum. falar em detalhes sobre esse exemplo? Uhum. Como que isso interage o dado à distância, o sensoriamento remoto e a aplicação prática para controlar ou acompanhar determinadas doenças? Yes. So, um exemplo. This, uh, I'm going to give you an example I just did. Uh, it's in uh, working with a village in uh, Tanzania. It's with the Maasai uh, people who are nomads and they have herds and there is a big problem of trypanosomiasis. So this is the sleeping um, disease the, transmitted by the tsetse fly. And uh, what I've developed now, it's the capacity to access the satellite images through your smartphone and to visualize what's going on with the precipitation, temperature, water, vegetation. And I did that because Three, we, three years ago, I was in the village there, and the chief was always on his cell phone, talking to everybody. So I said, if he has the capacity to access our telecommunications and discuss with all the, the other villages, what I've done is on the cell phone, now you can visualize in almost real time when it rains, where it rains, how the temperature is increasing, to see also where you can find the tsetse flight along the, the tiny river. And uh, we are testing this new methodology yeah. on the cell phone in the village there to be able to map the water and see how the water is shrinking. So where to go to find water for the earth, where the tsetse fly might be in the river and with the, the forest area, and to look at the temperature as well and to manage at high spatial resolution. You can see the tree, you can see the village, you can see the house of the person in the cell phone. So this is a new technology I developed with the University of uh, Arusha, there, Nelson Mandela University. Yeah. And this is something operational now. That's uh, fantastic. We are able to access all those data because now we have the satellite images that a couple of years ago, we had to go to the NASA, NOAA to download the data. It was difficult. But what I've been able to do now, thanks to new technologies like cloud computing and using a Google Earth uh, engine, I'm able, through the smartphone, to access this massive amount of data. So we, we are talking about big data. This is big data. This is all the satellite images that you can put on the smartphone and make decisions about the diseases. It's great. It's a very interesting mm -hmm. example. Mas uh, uh, nós também estamos hoje recebendo conosco aqui para a nossa conversa o professor Godoy, que é professor aqui do Hospital de Clínicas da Universidade, que também se interessa por esse tema. Eu passaria, Godoy, uma questão que você se apresenta ao professor Pietro. É, em relação a, ao que a, o, o médico o que está à frente do, do tratamento dessas doenças, as, o que as informações médicas poderiam ser associadas a essas informações disponibilizadas é, por satélite que pudessem, o conjunto dessas informações, melhorar ainda o, os dados da sua pesquisa? I think it's not yet there at the level of the hospital or the, med uh, the doctor. It's at the level of the ministries and the country where we work with this uh, uh, new technology. So at the ministries of health, they can make decisions. Uh, yeah. um, but I'm sure that in a few years, we'll be able to reach at the level of the doctor 
through the smartphone. As soon as, because everybody has a smartphone, as soon as we have developed the system, you know, in a couple of years, I'm sure that uh, at the village level, at the doctor level, we can have access to uh, those data. And that's the new revolution, I would say. In a couple of years, uh, I'm sure that we will be able to have that at the doctor level. I remember 20 years ago, I was in Africa, and uh, I was the only one to access the satellite images because I had to go with my antenna there. And uh, 10 years later, through internet, I could access the satellite images staying in New York without moving, having to go to the, the Madagascar or East Africa. And now with the smartphone, you can have access to those data. So we are in the stage where we can transfer that to the doctor in the village, to uh, any decision maker that needs the information about climate, about the environment, and see how it impacts and be prepared for risk of uh, a disease. For example, if there is a big flood in Malawi and uh, you can forecast the floods three to four days in advance, so be prepared and that's what we do with the International Federation of Red Cross. Start to be prepared for the flood events and then the doctor can have also the information where it flooded with the satellite images, which villages have been impacted, how many people have been impacted and make decisions based on that. How much, um, let's say, medicine to fight cholera do I need? Because I have X amount of people impacted by cholera or the risk. This is the f type of information that I'm pretty sure now with the development of all the technology and through the smartphone, you will be able to provide that information to the doctors uh, level. Nós certamente estamos falando do da importância dos controles ambientais e dos controles sociais nos processos de saúde e doença. Como que esse tipo de contribuição, Pietro, é recebido pela Organização Mundial de Saúde? Como que a Organização Mundial de Saúde hoje é, insere essas ações para o controle de, de, de doenças na população mundial? Ok, so uh, the work that we do with the World Health Organization is still a work that um, we had five projects the last three years there to show the importance of the climate and the environment on the diseases. So we had five projects in West Africa, East Africa, South Africa, on the, um, the trypanosomiasis, the malaria, the Rift Valley uh, fever, and uh, schistosomiasis. And so there we were able to show the importance of the climate information and the environmental information to make better decisions yeah. there. So I would say we are still at the stage where we are showing the impact of the climate, the environment, and starting making decisions out of that. In order, w the big hurdle that we had to, to overcome is how to access the data, the quality of the data, and how you interact that into decisions. Uh, how the climate impacts the disease, how the control impacts the diseases, how the infrastructure uh, impact the disease. So we start having the full pictures to be put into a system that we can make decisions based on data, based on knowledge that five years ago it was impossible. I would never be able to show to the ministries of health where the tiny uh, puddles of water occur because they build a road. By building the road, they create puddles and the mosquitoes were breeding there. So with the satellite images, I can see that. So the ministries of health at, uh, at the capital can see that and say, okay, I have a higher risk of malaria transmission in this area because we create a, um, a road, we create good conditions for mosquitoes. This is a type of information that now it's becoming possible through uh, new technologies to develop and to provide information to ministries of health up to the village level. This is brand new. The, the village level in uh, Tanzania with the Maasai, this is brand new. This is something that we just developed. Quer dizer, você acredita então que nós estamos é, nesse momento da, da história da ciência é, em uma direção de integração entre a ação do médico ele mesmo, ou seja, da medicina e da prática médica com os outros serviços que pegam mais a saúde pública e coletiva em termos de políticas e campanhas de maneira integrada. Nós uh -huh. estamos chegando a essa condição hoje. Uh -huh. Do you believe in it? 
I do, that's the way to, to go. <laughs> There's no other way. <laughs> because how can we understand a full program if you don't have the full picture? You need the full picture. You need yes. to understand what's the entomology of the vectors. You need to understand what's the diseases. For example, uh, when you have dengue, um, the big outbreak of dengue, it's the changes in the serotype. Yeah. So you need someone who knows about the serotypes, about the, the medicine. We need to know how the control has been done. We need to know how the infrastructure uh, aspect. We need to know how the climate is impacted. And so we need to integrate all those um, science and knowledge, which is more difficult, but also more exciting in the sense that you try to improve the... Sim, nós agora estamos é, caminhando para um tema que é dos mais sugestivos para a continuação do nosso debate, que é a relação entre mudanças climáticas e a doen as doenças, no caso brasileiro, dengue, zika, chikungunya. Uhum. Nós vamos fazer um intervalo de rapidamente alguns minutos e já voltamos para essa segunda parte em que nós pretendemos focar mais sobre o contexto brasileiro e a sua presença entre nós. Só um minuto, já voltamos. Retomamos o nosso debate, que hoje coloca no centro da discussão a relação entre saúde pública, saúde das populações, meio ambiente, políticas públicas. E para esse debate nós continuamos discutindo com o nosso convidado, o professor Pietro Secato, da Universidade de Colômbia. E para iniciar esse segundo bloco do nosso debate, nós vamos agora colocar em evidência uma questão muito interessante que o professor Godoy tem para nos apresentar. Professor Secato, o Brasil é tipicamente um país de medicina tropical. E no que os trabalhos que o senhor está realizando poderia contribuir em relação a acidentes que possam acontecer. Um exemplo disso, nós tivemos um grande acidente com barragem, nosso estado de Minas Gerais, é onde barragem de mineradoras romperam e houve um impacto ambiental muito grande. Então, nós temos dados assim de que a, a população de sapos diminuiu e, ao mesmo tempo, essa diminuição da população de sapos fez um aumento da população de mosquitos e, consequentemente, uma das consequências foi aumento da febre amarela. É, essas, esses dados que o senhor está tendo poderiam, de alguma forma, contribuir na, no manejo... Uh, yes, definitely. I think we can look at the impact of uh, the dam on there and how the, the water has impacted the downstream of the river. And using satellite images, we can monitor what was the impact. It's the same word. And in fact, one of my colleagues at Columbia University is looking at all the dams in the world and on the risk of breaking and what would be the impact. So using the satellite images, we can monitor what was the impact on the environment and um, we will not see the, the the frogs but we can see how it has impacted the ecosystem the, the vegetation and what's the the extent of the the problem and from there we can infer that the population of frogs has been uh, uh, decimated and all the consequences on the insect Uh, what we see also in another place, or other regions like in the Himalayan, we see with the, the glacier melt, and uh, that's due to the, the temperature increasing, we have more and more uh, dams and water that create a risk for the population living down the, the dam. And there we monitor that with satellite images and see how the dams are increasing and the risk for the local people living underneath the dams. That's, so this guy, the case of um, what happened in Brazil with the dam can also happen in other regions uh, of the globe. And so we do monitor those dams uh, with satellite images and see the impact and the risk uh, that activity. So this is a new technology. Um, this is easier to access. 
now and, uh, and to do those type of analysis that we could not do, uh, let's say, even five years ago. It was very difficult because it's very intensive, labor intensive. We didn't have the computers to, to do that. Now we have the technology and the capacity to do the, those type of analysis. So. Pietro, professor Pietro, eu gostaria de manter então nossa é, conversa sobre o Brasil. É, você nos, tem sido um, um colaborador muito importante para o nosso avanço em pesquisas aqui, recebendo estudantes lá nos Estados Unidos, vindo aqui nessas trocas que é, intercâmbio científico que temos feito. Nosso projeto nacional é sobre a dengue no Brasil. Né? Um bom período nós trabalhamos sobre a dengue. E eu gostaria de ouvi-lo sobre a relação das doenças transmissíveis, a dengue, por exemplo, e as mudanças climáticas. Como é que está sendo vislumbrado hoje, no campo da ciência, o futuro é, dessas doenças transmissíveis em relação às mudanças climáticas? Então, a pesquisa que estamos fazendo juntos sobre a dengue no Brasil é muito importante para entender qual é o impacto no clima da dengue and what are the other factors that also impact the dengue. And so we try to separate or to understand what's the component of the climate, what's the component of the, the, let's say, the transmission, the mosquitoes, the adaptation, also the changes in the, and the behavior and also the new um, serotypes. So once we understand the component of the, the climate, we can see the projection of the climate. For example, we know that the temperature is increasing. By experience, we've seen already in uh, countries like Ethiopia and Kenya, in the highlands, the temperature is increasing and the mosquitoes is going up. And villages that didn't have malaria now have malaria because of the increase of the temperature. And it's possible that this is going to happen in Curitiba as well. Not so many cases of dengue for the moment, but if the minimum temperature and even the maximum temperature is increasing, we might have more conditions for transmission of the diseases. This one part is the climate. There are also other parts changing in the serotype, uh, changing in the control measures, uh, changing on in the infrastructure. So all those components have to be taken into account with the climate. And um, so that's what we are doing uh, as research to understand in Brazil, in 10 different cities, what are the components of the, uh, the climatic impact. I was in Rio two weeks ago uh, at Fiocruz, and yeah. that's the same problem. Try to understand the relationship between dengue in Rio with the climate there. Yeah. So the climate there in Rio, uh, it's really suitable for the dengue transmission during January, February, March, when it's wet and yeah. hot. Uh, during the, the season, the, the, the winter season, there are no risk of um, dengue. And uh, as an example, my son who is traveling with me was bitten by mosquitoes. Seven days after he has red skin, I say, okay, that's dengue. I say, no, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> There's no dengue transmission in winter time because it's too cold uh, for that. So we try to understand when the climate is impacting the transmission of the disease and trying to understand the other factor. And in the case of the climate change, so if the temperature is increasing, and that's what we observe with all the measurements that we have in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, it's possible that Curitiba, which doesn't have dengue, might have good conditions for transmission of dengue and increase the number of uh, cases in Curitiba. Sim, nós estamos é, dando muito destaque na nossa pesquisa, e, e você está Uh, acentuando essa, esse aspecto da influência do clima sobre a doença ou sobre as doenças transmissíveis. Mas é preciso também uh, não deixar de lado o fato que a gente também trabalha, que são as vulnerabilidades sociais. Uhum. Ou seja, há uma condição econômica, uma condição social, que também é extremamente importante para entender a propagação dessas doenças. Uhum. E quando a gente fala desse aspecto econômico e social, nós sempre vamos lembrar da do desenvolvimento da pesquisa, no caso brasileiro, que é mantido pelas instituições públicas. E nós estamos, é, nesse último ano, é, sofrendo intensos e sucessivos cortes de recursos para pesquisas, como, por exemplo, essas pesquisas que desenvolvemos. Ou seja, é, estamos atravessando uma crise importante econômica, uma crise política que tem impacto direto nas instituições públicas e, por exemplo, em políticas públicas de controle de doenças. Como que nos Estados Unidos, agora sob o governo do 
é, presidente Trump, é, está sendo desenvolvido esse tipo de pesquisa nos Estados Unidos? Como que está acontecendo o financiamento, a produção é, da pesquisa com base no Estado dos Estados Unidos? Uhum. So that's true that in terms of research, and I experience myself in the sense that the money is getting shorter and shorter from the government there. And we need to continue the research to understand what is the impact on the climate, on the disease, and how to fight the disease. Because at the end of the day, it impacts everybody, the, the rich and the poor. And from the governments, we have less and less funds coming towards doing this basic research to understand what's going on. In the US, the difference is maybe that we have the private sector that's it's filling a little bit the gaps. I say a little bit because still the private sector doesn't provide enough money to do basic research, to understand the problem. What they want is really answers there and something very quick. And it doesn't give us the possibility to do the fundamental research, to understand the problem. We have to come up with quick solutions to the system. And if the government is not playing that role to provide the funds for the research to understand the problem, then we have the risk that we have in the US or even here, is to come up with quick solutions that don't fit and we don't understand uh, the problem. And it's not that we can hide our face or close our eyes that say, no, the problem doesn't exist about the climate and I think, no, the problem is there, it's recognized and it's impacting everybody. So we need to find a way to continue to do this basic research to understand all the relationship to better improve the health for everybody and to control those diseases. So now we have Zika, that's you know, new yeah. things that is coming. Do we know everything about Zika? No, there's plenty of things that we don't understand. How can we manage these problems if we don't understand uh, all the implications between the environment, the climate, uh, the, the people, how they live? And we cannot provide solution if we don't understand the problem. So in order to provide a solution a way for the, the decision maker, for the ministries of health to fight, to control and to protect the population, we need to understand the, those problems. And the challenge that we have in the US as here is it's difficult to get funds to do this basic research there yeah, to understand the problem. And so we are always struggling, <laughs> trying to find uh, money from the private sector, from the government. And we, we are working uh, uh, days and nights to try to find funds to advance the knowledge and to, to protect the populations for against those diseases. And so yeah. that's a problem that we are facing as well in the US. Um, and that's the reality. And mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, we need to find a way to maintain this research to understand the problem so we can control. If we don't understand what are the, the causes of those diseases, We cannot control the yeah, yeah. uh, certo tempo você já colabora conosco no Brasil, é, não só na universidade, que é a Federal do Paraná, que é um projeto que já tem bem aí uma década de desenvolvimento, mas você também colabora com a Fiocruz. Como que é, conhecedor de várias experiências no mundo, vários países, como que você vê a pesquisa na saúde pública brasileira. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, my experience with uh, Fiocruz, uh, I've been working uh, with Fiocruz in Rio, in Manaus, basically providing training to the, the doctors, the researchers, how to use uh, climate information to better understand uh, the relationship there. And um, I do the same in Africa with a different organization, uh, in, Lat in Asia as well. And so, uh, Here, the quality of the researcher in uh, Fiocruz and here, it's very good in the sense that you have the good fundamental understanding of the diseases and uh, the next step is try to understand the relationship with the climate, with the environment, uh, that aspect. And so for me, it's always a pleasure to, to work directly with Fiocruz, with the University of Federal do Parana, because we improve very quickly the understanding and the research. Uh, Uh, in order to come up with solution for controlling the diseases. Okay, thank you very much. Eu aproveito essa esse momento desse debate e como nós estamos falando na televisão da Universidade Federal do Paraná, 
Exatamente, para é, com muita satisfação falar desse convênio que foi assinado pelo professor Ricardo Marcelo, reitor, na, na data de ontem, na presença do professor Pietro Secato, foi assinado um convênio, um, uma cooperação entre a Universidade Federal do Paraná e a Universidade de Colômbia para é, dar suporte institucional a, esse, a esses intercâmbios científicos. Uhum. É um convênio amplo, é um convênio das duas universidades e o convite fica aberto a toda a comunidade universitária da, da Universidade Federal do Paraná a aproximar-se dos professores e pesquisadores da Universidade de Colômbia e proporem é, cooperações, intercâmbios nos temas mais específicos que cada grupo tem seu interesse. Porque agora nós, a partir desse momento, temos um, um convênio já assinado, que vai ser assinado agora pelo reitor da Universidade de Colômbia, agora no mês de agosto para setembro, e a partir daqui então nós teremos um suporte institucional, uma convenção assinada para promover o intercâmbio de professores, pesquisadores, estudantes nos mais variados campos do conhecimento e que vem a se somar a né, essa nossa ideia, esse desafio da internacionalização da ciência e, na Universidade Federal do Paraná com esse convênio, mais uma oportunidade sendo aberta. Então é um convite que fica aberto, é um momento em que nós, na universidade, nos sentimos muito contentes com isso. Eu quero agradecer ao professor Pietro por é, estar participando conosco dessa pesquisa, ter vindo a esse debate, e agradecer a todos vocês a atenção, a audiência a esse debate. Muito obrigado a todos, até a próxima.